Hello and welcome to the latest MS Here from the Experts webinar. This series is helping people better understand multiple sclerosis, highlights MS-related resources, plus provides tools and tips to help navigate their MS journey with more knowledge and confidence. Our intention is to help you learn more about the disease, treatments, research, wellness strategies, our programs, and much more. My name is Gabrielle Vito, and I'm a longtime volunteer with the MS Society of Canada since my own diagnosis way back in 1996. It's a real privilege for me to be here today and learn alongside you. I am your moderator for today's, ses for today's session. Now, we'd like to take this opportunity to share that as of January 1st, there has been a name change and the society is now called MS Canada. Under this new name, we will continue to fulfill the mission of the MS Society of Canada and the MS Scientific Research Foundation. We are building upon our 75 year history of supporting the MS community and funding the most promising research to identify the cause and cure for MS, plus the development of new treatments. It is a new name, but we have the same vision, a world free of MS. Stay tuned because over the next weeks and months, you will hear more about the transition and you'll see changes which will include our visual presence, especially on social media. They will be a refreshed website that will also be more user friendly, plus incorporate more engagement opportunities for the MS community. And of course, there will be new email addresses. Now, before we get started with today's presentation, let's briefly go over a couple of housekeeping items. Your microphones have been muted and will remain muted for the entirety of today's broadcast. If you have a question for one of, for today's panelists, please type it into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and we'll get to as many questions and feedback as possible following the formal presentation today. Now this session is also being broadcast on Facebook Live and we welcome that audience to also type any questions into the chat box. Please note, like always, that questions pertaining to your own personal situation cannot be answered in this type of a forum. We recommend that you contact your personal MS healthcare team or perhaps contact the MS Knowledge Network for questions about your personal situation. This session today is being recorded and will be available soon on our website in English. We're also adding French subtitles, but that won't be available for several weeks. The recordings are available on the website under Nationwide Webinars from the archived page. They'll also be on the YouTube channel and a Facebook recording will also be available. Now also please note, as always, the MS Society of Canada or MS Canada does not approve, endorse or recommend any specific product therapy or service, but provides information to assist individuals in making their own health and wellness decisions. So today's broadcast is an opportunity to learn more about setting wellness goals that can make positive changes to enhance your quality of life, even when there may be some bumps in the road along your MS journey. Doing something is always better than doing nothing, so identifying realistic steps towards achieving your goals is crucial to success. Our expert today is Rebecca Higgins. She has worked in community and social services for more than 20 years, specializing in mental health education since 2010. She has a master's degree in social work and a BA in English. Rebecca has designed and facilitated workshops and webinars for a wide range of groups, including educators, caregivers, customer service professionals, and many more. In addition, she has served as a panelist and presenter at numerous conferences, delivered keynote speeches on mental health, and provided consultation support to community mental health initiatives. We're very glad she's here with us today. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us today for this session. So today we're talking about setting workable wellness goals, and I'll give some examples of those as we go. So I will invite you, if it's convenient for you, to have something to write on and something to write with. This is a reflective workshop, so there will be opportunities for you to jot things down, um, some reflection opportunities. And at the end of the session, you can choose whether you'd like to share any of that with us or keep that for your own, uh, for your own information and support later on. 
So there is a little bit about me. Um, Gabrielle already welcomed me with a great introduction, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I have been working with what is now MS Canada since 2018, uh, in a, both in person and for the last few years doing workshops remotely this way. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. So I'd like to begin with some reminders that might help. These are reminders that have helped me and others that I that I have known personally and professionally in terms of setting and navigating working towards our wellness goals. So I'm just gonna jump in here because at my end, we're having a little bit, oh, there you are. You had frozen at my end, Rebecca. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I think no you're back. No problem. If um, maybe Stan, you can just give me a quick note or somebody can give me a quick note in the chat there and make sure that, um, that I'm good. Okay, perfect. So these are some reminders that have been helpful for me and for others in my life. And uh, they may help you, they may not, but I just want to reminder is uh, one of my credos really is something is better than nothing. So when we're talking about wellness, there are a lot of different dimensions of wellness. Um, and one element can be physical activity. And so, so in the early days, not the early, in some before now, um, the research around exercise stated that you needed to do a certain amount per week for it to be, uh, they have changed, they, the elusive they have changed their minds around that and recognize that any exercise is better than nothing. And so I like to, um, sort of extend that. Um, sorry, folks. Um, um, I'm just seeing a little trouble. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, I'll just keep an eye on that. It seems like everything's okay on my end in terms of internet and so on. Uh, let me just do one more quick thing that might help that, but. Um, you can just keep me posted, uh, colleagues there. I will try my best to, to navigate this. So uh, something is better than nothing is something that um, I have found helpful in other areas as well. It reminds me to take one step at a time. It reminds me a little bit is better than nothing at all. And it helps me um, to remember that really, as I said, something is better than nothing. Um, this is something that first resonated with me in early days of the pandemic when it was difficult to connect with others. And I remember having a Zoom chat with some friends and um, one of them was saying, you know, this isn't good, this isn't as good. And I said, well, something is better than nothing. The next tip is up the ladder one rung at a time. So sometimes I say one step at a time, but sometimes what we need to do is laddering with kids experiencing anxiety and parents of care, parents and caregivers of kids experiencing anxiety. And one of the recommendations around facing anxiety is called laddering. So for example, if you are, um, if you have a child, uh, and hopefully just keep me posted about the audio. I can, um, so in terms of laddering, if there is, for example, uh, a child that an example of laddering would be, first of all, together we'll watch a YouTube video about swimming. And then maybe we'll go to the pool and watch the kids from outside. And then maybe after that, we'll sit in the bleachers. And so what you're doing is adding one ladder, one rung at a time to help the person to get to their goal. But we can also do this for ourselves as well in terms of wellness. One ladder, what, going up the ladder, one rung at a time. This gives us the opportunity to celebrate our milestones as we go. And I'll talk a little bit, bit more about milestones later on. The third point I like, not just because it rhymes, not today, that's okay. 
Sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say, and if we don't feel up to it today, if we don't feel well physically or emotionally or both, and we're not able to do that element of our wellness goal that we set out for today, it can be tempting to just say, oh, I'm not even good father, or be really hard on ourselves around it. But that's actually not useful. It doesn't help motivate us. And I'll speak to that a little bit later as well. Instead, I have found it helpful to give myself permission. Okay, if it's not happening today, that's okay. We'll try again tomorrow. Rather than putting on this, putting this sort of um, all or nothing approach, instead, we can look at it as, okay, I don't feel well enough to do it today. What can I do today? Or am I going to rest today? Rest can be a wellness goal in itself. Oh, sorry, I just seem to not be able to move to the next slide. I'm not sure why that is. There we go. Thank you very much. So what I'll invite you to do is to jot this down for yourself. And at the end, if anybody wants to share in the chat, we can look at that then. So this is just to get your the wheels of your brain turning in terms of your current approach to wellness. So the first question I invite you to respond to is what's something that you've already been doing that supports your wellness? And you can interpret that however you want in terms of, you know, activity, connections, hydration, rest, and these are just a few. Diet. What's something you've already been doing that supports your wellness? That's number one. And then number two is what's something you'd like to start doing to support your wellness? What's something you'd like to start doing to support your wellness? So I'll give you just a moment to reflect on that before we continue on. Just about one more minute to reflect on this, these two questions, and then we'll continue on. Okay, beautiful. Thanks everyone for jotting that down. And again, if you're following along um, the pre recorded version of this, you can certainly pause and, and do the same there and just jot down or feel free to pause the recording and jot down something that you've already been doing that supports your wellness and something that you'd like to start doing to support your wellness. Next slide. Thank you. So here we are going to talk for a moment about SMART goals. So you have probably heard of SMART goals before. There's a little addition I found on the internet, the ER in SMARTER goals that I'm gonna to speak to in a moment. But first we will review what SMART goals are. So the research tells us that when goals are SMART goals, following this acronym of TIPS, 
they we are more likely to reach them. Um, if we just have a vague sort of goal, like I want to work on my wellness, that's great, but it's more of a dream or an idea. If we we are more likely to take steps towards our goals when we concretize them using a tool like SMART. So a SMART goal is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So if we go to the next slide here, I can show you some examples of that. Perfect, thank you. So I just I tried to two two that are relevant for me and that um, might be relevant for you, or perhaps you could, uh, you know, modify it for something that works for you. But I wanted to give you two examples of SMART goals before we mo move on. So one goal could be to go to Aquafit class on Friday afternoons at the community pool every week for the next four weeks. So that's specific. It's measurable. We can measure. Um, you know, I'll know when I've done it because I will have gone to four weeks of Aquafit. It's achievable because the pool is nearby and I know that I can do that. It's and it's cost effective as well. It's achievable because in this case as well. It's realistic. If I said I'm going to go to Aquafit for the next 10 months, that wouldn't be realistic for me. But this could be realistic. And time bound. So again, the time there is the four weeks. So I know when it starts, I know when it ends. And what's helpful about that is it helps us to stay motivated when we have uh, sort of a specific time time period that we're working within. It helps us to stay motivated to keep working towards it. And we also know when we're done. And then we can make a new goal if we choose. The second goal is to connect with a friend or family member outside my household, so someone I don't live with, and with whom I enjoy connecting, once a week for the next six weeks. This can be in person or virtually. So that is another example of if, let's say, your wellness goal, one of the wellness goals you're interested in right now is reaching out more or sort of strengthening up your existing connections. Sometimes in the winter, we get even more isolated than we are at other times of the year. Um, a lot of other reasons why you might, um, you might not be as connected as you'd like to be. So um, sometimes we have to be quite deliberate and intentional in reaching out. And this could be an example of another concrete SMART goal. Next. Okay, so um, when I was doing, uh, putting together an earlier version, oops, sorry, just one back. Thank you for your patience, folks. For some reason, I'm not able to switch through the slides myself today. Um, I'm just having a bit of a tech problem. So thanks so much for your patience. So in terms of uh, when I was working on an earlier version of this presentation for another group a couple of years ago, I was looking up SMART goals and I saw that some folks on the internet were talking about SMARTER goals. And I really love the idea of my own uh, goal setting and my own um, sort of uh, attitudes and approach around wellness. So E stands for evaluate. So from time to time, we've set a goal for ourselves and it's not working. Either our circumstances have changed, um, you know, it's not important to us anymore. Um, you know, it's important, but we can't do it right now. So leaving some flexibility, leaving some room to return to your goals, to evaluate them, and to make changes where needed. This can really help us to keep moving towards our goals. It gives us, I mean, we're allowed to change our mind, right? So sometimes something that works for a while doesn't work anymore. Um, or there's other reasons why we may choose to, to evaluate the goal that we set for ourselves. So I certainly invite you to re return to your goals. And a good way to do this is to write them down. And then you can return to them from time to time and see, is this still working for me? Is this still you know, possible and meaningful and so on? And then the last one is reward. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I really think um, we need to be our own cheerleaders and we need to find ways to celebrate the 
towards our wellness. Um, Um, uh, now I am. Thank you very much for that. Thanks everyone so much for your patience. Let's just move myself out of the way so that I can see what I'm doing. Okay, wonderful. Let me just add that back. And now we are off to the races, as they say. So the next section of this presentation, I'm going to refer to a great document called Goal Setting in a Year of Uncertainty from the Mental Health Commission of Canada. So the Mental Health Commission of Canada is one of the resources uh, I use quite often. They've got some great information there um, around various elements of mental health, and they put out uh, a bunch of stuff, understandably, in the early days of the pandemic. I think this one came out about midway through uh, the last few years, and I found it very helpful because although it was sort of designed to support our goal setting in a pandemic, um, it also, I think, is relevant for anybody experiencing periods of transition and uncertainty, which is most of us at some moment or other in different shapes and forms. I'd like to give you a couple of examples of um, tips from this document that I've found helpful. Number one is focus on the short term. So perhaps you're looking back at the examples you wrote about earlier. You might be thinking about other short term goals that are important to you. Some examples could be go for a walk three days this week or one day or whatever works for you. Attend a wellness workshop. Check mark. Done. Contact two friends this week. What else? So I invite you to think about what are some ex other examples that are relevant and resonant for you? Short-term goals. I'll just leave that for a moment before we move on. Okay, and what I'll invite you to do is jot down a short-term goal that matters to you right now. Could be the one, something you brainstormed about earlier, could be something fresh. A short-term goal in some way related to your wellness that matters to you right now. Okay, and so although we're focusing on the short term when we're looking at periods of transition and uncertainty and potentially difficulty, there's also space and joy in leaving room for the long term. I like this note from the document from the Mental Health Commission of Canada that goal setting is an expression of hope. So don't worry about firm deadlines for long term goals. Just think big alongside your more concrete short-term goals. And this doesn't have to be related only to wellness. That's what we're talking about today, setting workable wellness goals. But also I will suggest that the net of wellness reaches quite wide. So for me, some of my um, goals in terms of my creative work still would fall under in the wellness net, I think, because I know that creative work uh, helps me. I like that um, gentleness here around don't worry about firm deadlines and that, you know, the, the, the exercise of goal setting can be an expression of hope. So I'll just give you a moment to briefly jot down a long term goal that is important to you. Again, you don't have to set it up in the smart format or anything like that. Just something that works for you, a long-term goal that's important to you.
Tip number three is one that I also really enjoy, balance pleasure with purpose. Quote, goals related to activities that bring you joy are equally important to those based on achieving success. Committing to a hobby or to social connections can be just as fulfilling as dedicating yourself to material success or a sense of purpose. And I think certainly uh, committing to a hobby or to social connections are really important wellness goals. So I think those are great examples there. Balancing pleasure with purpose. And certainly in my own life, when I feel joy or hope or I'm curious about something that I'm working on, that all of these things really help with the purpose piece when there's pleasure in it as well. So I'm going to leave a moment here for you to return to the goals you've jotted down so far in this session. And just ask yourself whether these balance pleasure with purpose. And if not, you can feel free to change your goals and you can certainly do that later after the session or sometime in the future. But maybe just make a little notation. Any of them need a little reworking so that they help to balance pleasure with purpose, because we're certainly more likely to work towards our goals if we have experienced pleasure in the process. My favorite example of this personally is, uh, it took me about 40 years to actually learn that exercise is good for my mood. People had been telling me my entire life. I said, yeah, yeah, leave me alone science, research, the world, everybody was telling me, how about you move around a little bit from time to time, it might be good for your mood. And I said, you don't know anything, stop telling me what to do. I tried from time to time, but I hated it. I hated exercising, I hated moving around. <laughs> so I tried to do it as little as possible. It turns out, and again, it took me 40 years to find this out for myself. And if we don't find it out for ourselves, we don't really learn it, at least in this particular realm for me that actually the trick is find something you love or even find something you don't hate and try to do that a little bit and that is what has what is what has really changed my relationship with exercise is because i discovered i love swimming and now i swim i swim slowly and i love it so Finding something that you love to do is really important when we're talking about goals. And in my experience, it's also particularly important when we're talking about wellness goals. There has to be some desire, some joy, some delight in at some point in the process, or we're just not going to do it. Another tip that can be helpful is to look at your goals and see if they align with your personal values. Just like we're more likely to do it if it brings us joy or if it helps open pathways to joy, we're also more likely to do it if it matters to us, if it aligns with our personal values. So some examples of values that might be important to you, connectedness, respect, reliability, independence, compassion, open-mindedness, altruism, creativity, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means. But oftentimes we find that if our goals are in align with our in alignment with our values, they matter more to us then. And if they don't matter to us, we're not really going to do it. And so any time that we can try to align our goals with our values, that makes it more likely that we're going to continue along that path of reaching our goals and that those goals matter to us. If you're not sure how to tap into your core values. If you're not, sometimes they change over time as well. Though the core values tend to stay there underneath, but at some moments they might be more present than others. There's lots of great resources on the internet, lots of those fun values quizzes if you're interested. But there's also a simple practical way you can reflect on your values. And this exercise is called Meaningful Moment. So I'll just invite you to jot down Meaningful Moment if this is something you'd like to do later, think back to a meaningful moment in your life. Think about the elements of the situation that made it meaningful. These elements will likely represent some of your core values. So it could be an experience you had with family member or friends. It could be an experience you had with um, 
a beloved pet. It could be in a spiritual setting or a spiritual practice. It could be in a place that meant something to you. And I find this to be a useful reflection around, okay, so what's meaningful to me? And sometimes it's about reaching back into our past for a meaningful moment to help us to identify what some of those core values are. Tip number five, I love from this document, give yourself grace. When we're setting goals and trying to follow our goals, it can be very tempting and very seductive and very easy to say, oh, I'm terrible. I can't believe I can't even do this. I can't even do this one little thing that I set out to do. And when we are critical of ourselves in that way, it doesn't do anything to help us towards our goals. It doesn't hurt, help anyone, and it hurts us. And it certainly doesn't motivate us to move towards our goals. So sometimes people who are tend to, I mean, we all tend towards this self-criticism from time to time, but sometimes people hearing about self-compassion and being kind to ourselves and, you know, making space for our pain and being gentle with ourselves and loving, sometimes people think, no, that's not going to work for me because being hard on myself motivates me. And I share this beautiful book called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. Two great quotes that I'd like to share from you. They say that people resisting self-compassion are, quote, often worried that if they stop beating themselves up, they'll lose all motivation. They'll just sit around watching Real Housewives of Anywhere and eating Lucky Charms in a bowl full of Bud Light. Now, not that there's anything wrong with reality shows, <laughs> I'll tell you right now that uh, I watch my share. But the idea here is, I think, really significant that we do set up these zero sum games for ourselves where we think, oh, if I don't do this, if I'm not hard on myself, I'm never going to do it. And in my experience, it does not motivate us to be hard on ourselves. And Nagoski and Nagoski go further and point out it's not the whip that makes them stronger. It's their persistence, their relationships, their ability to rest. And so I love those three pillars as things that we can look to to shore us up in times of difficulty. Um, persistence, our persistence, our relationships, and our ability to rest. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Casey Davis. This is a beautiful book I always recommend. Uh, called How to Keep House While Drowning, A Gentle Approach to Cleaning and Organizing. And Casey Davis recognizes in this book that, you know, the t what she calls the care tasks of life, the day-to-day -day things of housekeeping and taking care of ourselves um, in various ways um, can be really difficult sometimes. And she has a lot of wonderful suggestions on how to make these kinds of things more manageable. She reminds us that there's a difference between skill deficit and support deficit. She says, quote, quit beating yourself up for having a skill deficit when what you really have is a support deficit. Self-care was never meant to be a replacement for community care. Striving to be better will exhaust the little energy you have, and it's probably time better spent letting yourself cry and sleep and finding small pockets of joy to keep you going. A support deficit is not always someone's fault. There are just some seasons of life that we have to limp through. And the reason why I include that quote here in this discussion around wellness goals is that I find this particular quote and the book in its entirety actually to be quite soothing and quite comforting when I am leaning into being hard on myself. And it leaves a little space and room. It's an opportunity to give ourselves grace a little bit, um, breathe for a moment, and then we can go back to our goals, evaluate, okay, maybe I need to tweak this or I need some support around this, or I can't do this right now because I don't have the support I need, or right now what I need to do is rest. And so 
I think this, again, a beautiful book for those interested in terms of, um, you know, the things that get billed as kind of everyday tasks can be extremely physically and emotionally overwhelming for many, many people. And so this is a great way to kind of navigate through that, I find, this book. A couple more tips to help you be gentle with yourself. Tip number one is to start your morning on a peaceful note. I love that. I have found that it takes me quite a while to wake up enough to be uh, alert and, um, you know, connected and engaged in the world. So some people uh, need a little time, some need more, but whatever is peaceful for you in the morning, whether it's a cup of tea on your own before others wake up, a cup, a cup of coffee. I like to sit beside my plants for a little bit, kind of just stare into space, whatever works for you. Starting your morning on a peaceful note really can um, be an important way to set the tone for the for the day in this moment where there's so many different elements that we don't have any control over. Um, deliberately making the choice to do something that feels peaceful to us first thing when we wake up or in the early part of, of the day for us um, can be really soothing. And again, this all falls under the category of number five, tip number five, which was give yourself grace. And this we need to give ourselves grace if we're going to keep moving towards our goals. Tip number two is just breathe. Sometimes breathing is a wellness goal in itself um, because sometimes here, of course, it means to just pause and take a moment and pay attention to your breath. The simplest, most manageable way to do this, I think, is the brainchild of the meditation teacher, Vietnamese meditation teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. He reminded us that you can simply say breathing in as you're breathing in and breathing out as you're breathing out. Sometimes meditation or longer breathing exercises, counting your breaths, this can be overwhelming and unmanageable for lots of folks. So sometimes just taking one breath in and out can give us the opportunity to be gentle with ourselves for a moment. Try micro cleaning. So that is a, a great uh, tip also aligned with the book I mentioned, How to Keep House While Drowning. You do not have to do everything all at once, all the time. I do know that some people find it helpful to do um, a big task that they, for example, cleaning your house or, um, you know, a big task for work or some big undertaking that you have. Sometimes some people seem to find it helpful to just buckle down and do the whole thing. For those of us who, for lots of reasons, may have um, ebbs and flows in our energy, I don't know how practical and realistic this is. Certainly, I find microcleaning to be much more helpful. You know, I'll do this little bit, I'll do this part of the floor today, or I'll do, you know, just doing things as they're needed rather than a whole overhaul. So this is about cleaning, but this could be about wellness goals as well. If you can't go for a long walk today, can you go for a walk around the block? Or if something isn't working today, if you're not able to do something, can you substitute it with something else? Tip number four is take one step outside. I think this is such a lovely idea. If you're able to, if not, you can open the window. Um, some way to access the fresh air, um, just to get a little bit of fresh air, a little bit of movement, if possible. Listen to a song. Really listening to a song gives us the opportunity to slow down be a little bit still, um, give ourselves a little bit of rest. Take a shower or a bath. Um, if you're not able to do that or, or you don't have the, the time or energy for that today, what can you do instead to modify this? Wash your face, wash your hands, or put some nice cream on your hands, something that soothes you, soothes your body. And tip number seven in terms of being gentle with yourself is changing your physical perspective. So this can be sometimes, um, you know, if you usually go for a walk in a particular neighborhood, I find we often end up going, um, in my household, we often end up going on the same routes for walks. Sometimes changing your physical perspective, going on a different route or looking up or down, looking somewhere different, trying a different park or a different outdoor space. Um, being in different spots in your house, looking at things from a different perspective in that way, all of these things can contribute to uh, us being a little bit more gentle with ourselves.
The next invitation I invite you to think about here is how do you celebrate your milestones? If you want another way to think about that is how do you reward yourself for taking steps towards your goals? And I think this is really an important thing to do. Um, not everybody agrees with me. Not everybody wants to wants to do this. And if this doesn't work for you, absolutely. But for me, um, I'll share an example. So I finished my second book a couple years ago. It hasn't found a home yet. And I knew it would take some time to find a publisher. So when the book was finished, which happens to be called Something is Better Than Nothing, my favorite thing, I ordered a wallet and got Something is Better Than Nothing engraved on the wallet as a little memento just for me that I had finished this manuscript. I don't know where it's going to go, if anybody will publish it. And sometimes what happens is you finish the thing and there's no fanfare. There certainly wasn't for me. I was like, hey, I did it. And then my closest people were like, great. And then that was it. And then nothing happens. So I think we need, again, to be our own cheerleaders. That was a way every time I see that, I remember, oh, yeah, I did that. I did that. Um, so you can really choose um, how you reward yourself. Um, but I think it's important that we mark our milestones in some way. We write it down. We celebrate with, with friends or family. We buy ourselves something. Um, you know, we go to a new spot. We take ourselves out to a new cafe. Whatever works for you and whatever is manageable. But I do think this is something that can really help us, again, to keep moving towards our, our longer-term goals as well. When we give ourselves credit and we when we sort of honor what we've done to take steps towards those goals already. A few other notes I'd like to share here on setting goals. The first is be honest about what you want. Um, when people told me to exercise for my whole life, um, they wanted me to exercise. I didn't want to. So anytime I kind of, you know, made some overtures towards exercising, I didn't really want to do it. Be honest about what you want. That's going to be a lot more helpful in terms of moving towards your goals. Goals don't have to make you unhappy. Sometimes we look at goals as things that we have to conquer. It doesn't have to be adversarial. Goals can actually really, um, in fact, contribute to our moments of joy um, and to our contentment. So choose goals that matter to you. Try to avoid measuring yourself against other people. The comparison game does not really work in terms of helping us to set and continue towards our wellness goals. Instead, think about measuring yourself against your former self rather than your future self. If you look at how far you've come in a particular goal area, you know, it can be tempting to um, just look into this sort of vague and often scary and uncertain future and say, you know, I'm never going to be able to get to this point with my wellness or whatever it is, or well, other people over there are doing a better job. No, instead, it can be much more valuable to measure yourself against your former self. Look how far you've come in this particular area. And remember that goals give you purpose. Oh, so those were just their references that informed this workshop. And I'll leave that up and uh, I'll turn it back over to the moderator in case anybody has any questions or things they want to respond to at this point. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for another informative presentation. That was just excellent. I think you've given us lots to think about, lots to consider. It is now time for questions. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box, either on Zoom or Facebook, wherever you're joining us from today. Um, I want to remind everybody, or actually introduce a new segment. You'll also see on your screen in the last uh, portion we're in now of today's session, some pop-up polling questions. Rather than sending you all a survey after the fact, we're doing a new sort of format where you'll see pop-up questions come up on your screen. We invite you to please respond to those to let us know um, how you feel about today's seminar topic and presentation. So while we're doing that, let me take a look at the questions. So we do have one, Rebecca, and you referred to this a little bit about goals not having to be things that 
we don't like. But this question is exactly that. What about the non-pleasure goals? Doing our taxes, decluttering the house. The reward is good, but the doing of it sucks. Uh, what's your <laughs> advice about that? So that's a great example. And you're right. We can't only, uh, the implication there is that like, we can't just walk it around, walk around doing goals that make us feel joyful all the time. And, and absolutely, I have those kinds of goals as well. Um, in terms of getting my taxes done, getting my stuff ready for my for my account to do our taxes and cleaning the house. Absolutely. So what I'll offer there is to go back to what I said at the beginning around one rung at a time. My favorite advice I learned from social work school is take when you're faced with a big overwhelming task, break it down and take into smaller, more manageable pieces. And then give yourself little breaks and little little goals as you go. So for example, you know, if I am for tax prep, I have to like, put, you know, put things aside for my business and enter certain things onto my software. So I found when I was originally used to do have it in my brain that I do that all in one go. I thought, oh, this is no, this is super boring. I can't sit down and do this for hours on end. And so instead, I broke it down into okay, today I'm going to do these fees. Tomorrow I'll do these. Um, and I have to say that finding your own little tricks in terms of things that satisfy you along the way can be helpful. So I really enjoy checking things off my list. Okay, I did this thing. Um, another thing that I've developed in the last few years that I have found very helpful, especially on those days where things are very overwhelming, is I like to do a done list. We can have a to do list till the cows come home. But I often do that actually in my same book where my to do list is I write down the things that I've done, the things that I managed to get to or the steps I took towards a goal. So if I did certain aspects of my taxes, or like I mentioned earlier about cleaning the house, I really find it helpful to break it down. Some people will break it down into rooms, I break it down into smaller things than that, like toilet, tub, you know, and then wrote down clean toilet. And then the next day or five days later, or a month later, clean tub, right? So that's been something that's been really helpful for me is is um, the done list instead of a to do list or alongside it. I love that idea sort of the, as you go, okay, that one's done, check that because that you're right, that reinforces for us that okay, I have accomplished something. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, great advice. All and right, these, our next. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add in these kinds of sort of mundane things, you know, we're not going to get a cheerleading squad. People don't really care. Even our closest people don't get as excited about finishing the small things and don't necessarily understand it, even if they're really close to us. That was a daunting task, and I managed to do one step of it. So I think, you know, honoring that for ourselves with a done list or something else like that, let's just kind of celebrate that with the person who cares the most about it, which is us doing those kinds of tedious things anyway. I love that line that you said, be your own cheerleader. I think that's so important to, to recognize what you are accomplishing, especially when you're dealing with something like living with MS, which is so different for all of us, but that, that reinforcing the what you can achieve for sure. Now, the next question we have is, what is the name of Rebecca's book again? Now, this is a book that you haven't yet published though, is that right? Oh, no. So, oh, this, I'm sorry, this wasn't supposed to be about me. The first, my first book is called The Colors of Birds. It's short stories that came out in 2018 with tightrope books. I wrote a second book, but it hasn't found a home yet. No, it's not out in the world uh, yet. Um, it's called Something is Better Than Nothing. So I shared that as an example of how I honored my own accomplishment because you know the big the big honoring won't happen maybe for some time it can take a lot of time to find a publisher so and my other yeah my other publisher closed up shop so this is this is how it goes with this kind of thing but um so yeah the book is called something is better than nothing but it's not out in the world yet <laughs> that's why i have my wallet that's right perfect i thought that as a reward <laughs> to yourself that's great yeah. Now, the other thing you said that really resonated with me, again, in the MS world and in my own experience, um, is rest can be a wellness goal. Because fatigue is my biggest symptom. I know it's a huge symptom within the MS community. And it can be such a journey to get to that point of realizing that it's okay when you need that rest and to forgive yourself for needing that rest. So I think that's a, that was an excellent, excellent point for this particular audience. 
Thank you. All right, I appreciate that. One. We um, anxiety. Why do long-term goals cause anxiety? There's a good question. Well, so it depends on the long-term goal. Sometimes um, mm -hmm. it feels like it's very far away. <laughs> And it feels like, oh, you know, when am I ever going to get this done? Or, you know, it seems so far away. And that's why I think holding space for both matters. Because, um, you know, short-term goals, we can see the results sooner. Um, but sometimes when we string those short-term goals together, over time, it becomes a, a longer-term goal, right? So I absolutely think, and that's where the evaluation comes into play as well. It's, un, it's normal and understandable to have some anxiety about the future, um, no matter your experience. Um, but, but certainly, um, you know, living with chronic health conditions such as MS, there's uncertainty about the future in a particular way. Although I think you know, that can be said for lots of other people as well. We don't know what the future is going to look like. So um, that can that can be can, sometimes I think that's where part of the anxiety comes is is alongside that uncertainty. You know, this seems very far away right now. Um, but I think we all need room to dream and to have ideas to work towards. And that's where, again, the evaluation comes back into play because I've had long-term goals that didn't work out or either I didn't, I didn't end up pursuing them or I pursued them and they, I didn't meet that goal. This happens. So I think we need to go back to the notion of our giving ourselves grace and being gentle with ourselves. Um, you know, we're not necessarily going to, I think it's unrealistic for human beings to reach every single goal they set, but that doesn't mean that there's not value in setting them and tweaking them and, you know, learning from the ones we didn't meet and what does that mean about what we'd like to do next and so on. I think we need to give ourselves some wiggle room around any kind of goal work. I think you're, you're, you're bang on and breaking those big goals down into smaller, manageable, workable, shorter term goals that really resonated with me listening to you, because that big overall goal, I need to get more fit. Well, that's a yeah. huge hill to go in one in one go. So how do you yeah. exactly that? How do you break it down into something you can do on a daily basis? Or what can you get done this week? I loved that tip. I thought I think that's a way better way to frame it in my own mind. I did your exercise as you were going along. And you know, it was sort of like, okay, I want to clean the bathroom this week. And then you started about talking about micro cleaning. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just do part of the bathroom this week. And next week, I'll do the rest. So absolutely, with me. absolutely, absolutely. There's no, there's in that book I've mentioned, there's this beautiful reminder, the Casey Davis book, this beautiful reminder around there's no um, moral imperative around cleaning. Like if you get the cleaning done today or you don't, it doesn't say anything about whether you're a good or bad person at all. It really isn't. It's just that sometimes we feel more comfortable when things are a little bit more clean. And sometimes we want to, you know, take steps towards that. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I think taking one small step at a time in terms of cleaning has really helped me in terms of actually doing it, I have to say. I see that Lori is saying, um, or there's a there's just a comment coming in, asking for help from others is okay too, is a comment. Absolutely. And that could be helpful too, um, you know, in, in things like cleaning, right? Is there somebody else that you can uh, delegate to a little bit or ask, can you do this piece and I'll do this piece? And it doesn't have to be somebody you live with. You know, um, you can also sometimes just you just want some company while you're doing the thing. Um, or, you know, can you talk to me while I, or you can help, can you help me fold my laundry next time you come over or when they're over? Um, and I think we can do this for each other too. When I'm visiting friends who I know have an awful lot on their plate, I'll be like, can I do this while we chat? Like, you know, there's ways that we can support each other in that way. So thank you for that comment. Absolutely. Asking for help from others is okay too. And, and could be a goal in itself actually in terms of wellness. So thank you for that. Well, that brings us to our time for uh, the, the end of our time for questions. And I think we've managed to cover a good array of them. Rebecca, thank you so much again for your time and your presentation today. It was just excellent. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. So Thanks, everyone.
Take care. So as we wrap up today's broadcast, we want to remind you about the MS Knowledge Network, which is staffed by trained navigators who provide consistent quality information and support. You can connect by phone, email, or live chat through the Society's website and know that the interactions and the information is trustworthy. Navigators can help you learn more about the programming and resources we offer to support individuals and families affected by MS. They can also help you find other community or government supports and programs and so much more. So for information and support, feel free to reach out to the MS Knowledge Network. Now, if you'd like to sign up for the monthly e-newsletter, an MS Navigator can help you do that as well. When you receive the e-news, you're kept up to date on the latest MS research and treatments, the Society's programs and services, fundraising and volunteer opportunities, inspirational personal stories from people affected by MS, and so much more. All of that can be delivered directly to your email inbox each month. Now, we invite you to be a part of the MS community and encourage you to get involved with our programs, services, events, government relations, and volunteer opportunities. These days, connecting with each other is more important than ever, and more information is available on the website at www.mssociety.ca. Volunteers are an essential part of the support we offer to Canadians affected by MS. The demand for assistance through our one-to-one -one peer support program and peer support groups is growing. And we need more volunteers to reach as many people affected by MS as possible. If you'd like more information or you're interested in getting involved, please reach out by email to volunteer at mscanada.ca. If you have questions or need support for this webinar or any of our educational activities, you can reach out to the education team, and that email is education at mscanada.ca. Well, that brings us to the end of today's broadcast. So on behalf of MS Canada, I want to thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.